Okay. Um, Hi. Welcome, Rabbi, Representative, and Staffman. Um, we're very, very pleased. The Gallant Democrats wish you a, the very best signy die, and we're so happy to have you here. Um, um, what are your parting thoughts on this session of the legislature within moments of signy die? Well, you know, I've been attending on Thursday mornings the legislative uh, Bible study with some of the most conservative legislators. And I'm in a for fortunate position where I can help them understand things because of the Hebrew and so on. And um, I was asked, not, not today, but a week ago, um, for what are some of the holiest words? And at that time I said, well, they're not in Hebrew, they're in Latin and they are sine die. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm extreme, extremely thankful that we've made it through um, and, you know, it was very painful and toxic for lots of reasons. Um, on the other hand, the results are not nearly as bad as we feared. Um, you know, we came in thinking they were going to destroy Medicaid expansion. They haven't. We came in thinking they were going to destroy public lands. Uh, they haven't. In both of those cases, I can talk more about it, that they have made some dents, right. but they haven't really destroyed it. Um, and in quite a few other areas, uh, you know, a lot of what they did accomplish that makes us so angry is cultural warfare right. that is unlikely to have much impact in many cases, um, it, except to hurt people, um, but not to you know, I think, for example, all of the anti-abortion bills, once the session is over, Planned Parenthood's going to go into federal court and get them all stopped. Um, but how long will that take? Oh, they'll get them stopped in two weeks, I think. You know, really? they'll get a preliminary injunction because they're so obviously unconstitutional. Okay. There's lots of other unconstitutional bills, too. <clears throat> so I just want to point out to people here who don't know you as well as I do, that you're both um, a rabbi um, and an attorney. So which one of those hats was most useful to you in this session? Neither. Ah. Because as an attorney, I brought knowledge of the law. Um, the majority doesn't really care about the law. And I brought knowledge of, of the ability to use reasoning and facts. And the other side doesn't care very much about reasoning or facts. Um, the rabbi had, I brought, tried to bring ethics and morality. The other side doesn't really care very much about that. Okay. And so um, neither hat was particularly useful. <laughs> um, but that's okay. I, I learned as a freshman, I learned a lot. Um, I'm very thankful to the members of the Democratic Caucus for teaching me, and uh, especially to Jim Hamilton and um, Tom Woods, who really helped me a lot um, before we got started, to Denise Heyman. Uh, you know, they've been invaluable to me. And, um, you know, it's been great working with Alice Buckley and with Kelly Cordham. Uh, this freshman of, class rocks. Yeah, uh, we, you know, those two are both a couple, I'm an old guy, but those two are some rising stars. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that's what helps us keep it together. But you know, Jim said something to me before the session that was very important. He said, think of this as spring training. We're not going to win anything, but you go in to hone your skills um, not to win so that when the season comes, you're ready. So I think next session, I'm hoping, will be the season. And now I will have the skills to understand how the process works with and the person's work. I had no it was a steep curve. I never knew it was quite as steep as it is. Uh, I mean, there's no way to know that until you get here. Um, and then, of course, COVID made everything 100 times more difficult. Uh, the fact that the first half of the session I was remote and so didn't get to really have personal relationships until halfway through the session. And by the time I started to make some, the session was over. And so what um, made you go into that room? 
Was it the vaccination? Yes. Well, yeah, vaccinate. That, that was, I mean, I still wore a mask, except when I was like speaking on the floor. But yeah, after two weeks after my vaccination, I, I felt like I could do that. And I think most of us did that. Few didn't. Um, so, but it made it really doubly hard. Um, and, uh, and also just as a side effect of all that is, you know, normally in most years, there's lots of functions in the evenings that lobbyist groups and stuff put on. And they become a way to meet your fellow legislators and to get to know them personally and, and to develop friendships. And that didn't happen this year because when I mean I think all year there were maybe three functions, wow. um, and uh, so that just made everything really crazy and doubly hard. Right. Well, we didn't have our lobby day. Normally, we take a, <laughs> an outing and have a lobby day, and and it, it's a practice session to get people engaged. And the last lobby day I went to. I sat side by side in the gallery with uh, Representative Kelly Corbin. It uh -huh. was it was just exciting. <laughs> so there he is down there in the well serving with you. Yeah, well, he's been remote all the whole time. Yeah. So I um, haven't seen much of him in, in face to face, but um, what he does speak from his computer, he he's really kind of staked out some ground and especially in voting rights issues. Yeah, and broadband, yeah. Well, yeah, we didn't, his broadband bill, bill failed ultimately. Um, but see, one the other thing that made this session so unusual and mitigated a good deal against what might have happened is the CARES money that we got from the feds from, and then the ARP money that we just got from, thanks to our democratic senators and and, and President Biden um, were, you know, we were worried about revenues and so on. And we came in and we're, I mean, we're just flush. But still the budget reflects these crazy priorities, like a whole bunch of money to, um, and you were on the judiciary, um, to fighting the judicial nominating committee in court. What's that 250,000? Yeah. To fight that. And then a hundred thousand for some other uh, judicial thing. And then uh, some money for Gianforte's staff. Meanwhile, they're cutting um, the chip. They're raising the chip copay for families and um, cutting other, you know, uh, Department of Health and Human Services budgets. Uh, yes. Um, although it's not nearly as bad as it might have been had we not had that money. It's real. Um, um, and so, you know, one of, uh, along the lines you were mentioning, one of the worst bills was S there were two really bad bills, SB 100, um, which sought to end continuing eligibility. Uh, and it, that's a long story what that's all about. But what it would essentially do is kick off about 20% uh, each year off of Medicaid expansion and chips, CHIP and uh, the TANF, the other programs. And the other bill was Jane Gillette's bill, which did the same, but even worse. And both of those bills, my committee defeated health, in Health and Human Services. Um, those would have been real disasters. So what did happen by comparison is pretty mild. However, after we killed these bills that would have ended what's called continuing eligibility, stuck into the budget bill that we got today, and I spoke against this, was a provision that the legislature is asking the Department of Health and Human Services to do it by rule, to end Medicaid eligibility. Uh, so uh, they're going to, so G. Gianforte was pushing for an end to continuous eligibility, which would devastate crowd, the, the folks who are on, who received these benefits. Uh, he didn't get it. We beat that. But he's gonna, he can do it by rule. And they put in the budget. Even though the budget is supposed to only be about money and not about policy, 
they stuck in this policy language that basically asks HHS to do what they couldn't do in the legislature. And um, so that's coming. That's the next battle. And it'll happen at HHS and people need to be ready to go give public testimony on that when it comes. Next and how, how will that show up? It, it, so this is not something that can be challenged in court, but it... Uh, well, it can be challenged in court, but, but so every government agency gets to make rules. Yeah, okay. And the funny thing is, Gianforte, of course, is all about that they want less rules. Sure. But he wants it to make more rules when it relates to Medicaid expansion. And the rules that he wants them to put in place, um, a basic would end continuing eligibility. Basically what it means is right now, every once a year, your eligibility is examined. Um, and, uh, and you have to continue to be eligible. They wanna change that to a, a shorter period. And what that does is let's say you're a seasonal worker mm -hmm. and for two months a year, you make more money than, than Medicaid allows. But for 10 months, you don't. So you get kicked off and then you have to go through this arduous process about getting back on. Mm -hmm. Or let's say you got a bonus. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're a minimum wage worker, but you got a bonus this month. You get kicked off and you have to start all over again. And what this does is it really um, is terrible for medical care because people from one month, one month you're covered, the next month you're not. And people don't follow up on their medical, medical care. And it ends up uh, with a lot more sick people. And a, so the only person who testified in favor of this idea was an out-of-state dark money group that's funded by Betsy DeVos. Against it were all the were Montanans from every walk of life, doctors, nurses, Indian tribes, um, insurance companies. Everybody in Montana was against this, except for this out-of-state dark money group. And... Uh, it, that that's one of the reasons it didn't pass. But now they're going to backdoor it. They're going to try to backdoor it in. So that's oh. and and I don't know exactly how you. I know they do take public comment on rules. I don't know exactly what the process is because that's not my department. But um, there is a process. Well, that's going to be all the docs and the hospital associations and the undone primary care, all those things. But it's also got to be grassroots too. Right. I mean, um, I remember taking groups of people um, in several sessions up to testify on Medicaid expansion. Um, it, depending on what the rule is, if they started looking at, at monthly incomes, that would be like whole jobs in that, in that, um, that department, which would be such a waste of money. Better to we, cover people. We got them on the record to say they're looking at going from 12 months to six months. Yeah. I heard in some states, they do it every three months. Oh yeah. So six months is better than three months. Um, the uh, so I was the one who made the floor speech about it today, but it was the way the it came procedurally. There was nothing we can do to strip it out. Yeah. So this is a, we call this a zombie bill. Right. In other words, it's back from the dead, right? We killed it in committee, bipartisan, and then it comes back for the dead, stuck in as a budget amendment. What about other local health issues? I know that they, so, I know that they're all about, you know, uh, leave local government alone, except when they want to interfere with land use planning, public health, um, yeah, uh, schools. Well, perhaps the, the, the greatest hypocrisy could be seen by um, examining two, two, the bills of the, the main work of two Gallatin County reps. Jed Dyer Hinkle and, and Carlson, Jennifer Carlson. So Jennifer Carlson introduced at least four or five anti-vax bills. And we're not talking about COVID vaccine here. We're talking about all vaccines. Mm -hmm. And what she, the, the one that she passed prohibits businesses from discriminating against people that don't have vaccines. And that would include hospitals. So if I, let's say I'm a, a business, let's say I run a business where I, uh, I'm a, I, it's a tourist company and we, we cater to elderly people. Maybe they're on a bus and we take them to Yellowstone or whatever. And 
I want to advertise that the bus driver and the tour guides are vaccinated against influenza because if an elderly pe person gets influenza, they can get, die. I'm um, thinking of wounded warriors, right? Right here. Yeah. So there's right. all sorts of people, right? And yeah. um, and so I can't do that. I cannot ask my employee about their vaccination status. Um, and in a hospital, Jennifer Carlson's bill originally applied to hospitals and nursing homes too. It was too radical for even the governor. Mm -hmm. And he made them take out the, the nursing homes. But it's still in there for hospitals. So the way it works for hospitals is a hospital can now ask you if you've been vaccinated, but you don't have to answer. And if, 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 you, if you don't answer, they treat you as if you have not been vaccinated but they can't fire you or anything. They just have to give you, uh, they have to accommodate you by giving you some other job. So let's just say you're a surgeon and you're being paid $200,000 a year, but you can't perform surgery because you don't have the proper vaccines. So they have to give you some other job, like a desk job or something. I don't know where they put you. They can't, so I view it more like that you're, that, that having a vaccine is a, a qualification. Right. I mean, Right, just like if you came in, you, you have the choice to get a vaccine or not. And that's one of the qualifications, should be one of the qualifications of the job, but they've turned it into this kind of discrimination. That at the same time, then you go to Jedediah Hinkle's bill. And Jedediah Hinkle's bill says that a business cannot discriminate against anyone who refuses to wear a mask or, uh, or follow other public health di directives. So on the one hand, uh, a business cannot discriminate against somebody um, who doesn't want to wear a mask. And, and, and Jennifer's bill is a business cannot discriminate against somebody who doesn't um, um, uh, get a vaccine. And now add to that RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which says that a business can discriminate on their religious, if, if their religious uh, values author, allow it. So you so right now, the, the bottom line is this, a business is free to discriminate based on your gender identity, but not on the basis of masks or vaccines. That's the state of affairs now in Montana. And all this with a Supreme Court that's being attacked, right? So- Montana Supreme Court, yeah. Yeah. And did uh, the Senate um, ever uh, nominate or uh, go through with the, uh, the appointment of uh, the judge, I think it was Judge Abbott in uh, Helena? They did. Well, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee turned Confirmed. it down, but it was blasted to the floor and by a couple of votes, Judge Abbott was appointed. So two out of the three um, judges that had been appointed by the prior governor actually got in. Right, but they still have to run for election. And uh, did Gallatin well, get? Gallatin got Judge. Uh, we got um, Peter Oman. Now, Peter Oman. did they give us another judge? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. So that's in the budget. Yes. Oh, maybe you're right that you know some things were, you know, mitigated. Uh, it does. It does feel pretty awful, and it feels like. Um, just me and as, as an observer and, and an advocate for so many fronts here in Montana, um, that I'm not really gonna know, nor are the organizations that I care about um, going to know, you know, what they can and cannot do for like a couple weeks or a month after their lawyers have looked at uh, what really went down. Yeah, it's very confusing. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just, vicious and nasty, but thankfully doesn't impact so many people. Um, and some of it went down. I mean, we did defeat the bill that interferes with a trans kid's ability to get gender affirming treatment. We managed to beat that. But we, but it did, the other bill, the one that prohibits trans girls from playing on a girls sports team passed. And that was terrible as that is. As, as much as it strips trans kids of their human dignity. Yeah. The good news is it's probably just a few people. Now, that doesn't make it any better for those few people, but it's not like some sweeping policy change where thousands of people have been, have lost their 
food, their, their ability to buy food. And perhaps and so, their docs, the what? docs who treat them, and perhaps the doctors yeah. who treat them. So I, I don't mean to <clears throat> minimize in any way the impact of that, right. but, yeah. the, but the impact, it, you know, they, they do it to appeal to their base that, look, we hate trans people. They don't really care about how many people are impacted or you know what way they're impacted this is all about pat this is the trump pandering to the base of hate yeah and and the gun rights thing i mean you know that passed where we're now going to see guns no. flourishing on campus i just got know, a, pandering to their base yeah yeah so on that you know people listening uh reach out to ochi at montana dot Oh, I don't know. If you want the address, I'll send it to you. Uh, put it in the chat when you see this uh, recording come out uh, because you can respond to the OG request. Uh, and um, oh, man, uh, my, head, my head is blank and I'm sorry, I was gonna ask you a question. Um, uh, so what is the most uh, consequential bill of this session, do you think, in your opinion right now? You know, it's a very hard question to ask, answer because there are so there are many bills that are consequential in their particular realm. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, the attacks on the judiciary, which is not one bill but eight or ten bills, mm -hmm. that threaten the integrity, the independence of our courts. And remember, so there's a theme, and one of the themes is power grab. And so, who are the organizations that whose power has been grabbed? One is the courts. Um, by trying to politicize them and, and pack them with, with right-wing um, ideologues. And we could talk for a long time about the bills that do that. Another one is the Board of Regents. So any number of bills, what, even though our Montana Constitution says that the Board of Regents has exclusive control over what happens on universities, the only thing the legislature gets to do is appropriate money, there were, there's quite a few bills which tell the Board of Regents how to run the universities. Uh, another one is local governments. Yeah. You know, local governments normally are free to do whatever is needed for their communities. The only exception is if the legislature specifically takes away that power. And the legislature took away that power in many, many ways this time. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, power grabs of courts. Uh, Board of Regents, local governments, um, uh, for a certain extent from the from child protection services. Mm. Uh, there's a whole subset of the legislature that thinks that child protective services, in fact, one of the legislators actually said that the Department of Health and Human Services, he thinks is a uh, front for for child for a child um, a child trafficking ring. That there's a whole bunch of them that believe that. And so, and there are these people who've lost their kids who come in and, and complain that child, that CPS is like snatching their kids in the middle of the night. But we, we don't get to hear the other side of the story as to why they did take their kids because they're bound by confidentiality, but the other side can come in and scream about it all day long. Um, so there was a lot of that. Um, it seems like other areas as well don't come to mind where there's been power grabs. Oh, power grabs on fish, wild, wildlife, and parks. You know, they normally make the rules about conservation of, and species. And we got all sorts of bills that usurp their authority, uh, trapping of wolves, um, elk, elk, elk tags going to rich out of state hunters, um, uh, the limiting of. Uh, uh, raising the, making it easier to kill grizzlies. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of bills that, that were aimed at, um, at limiting, at, at grabbing power from the scientists and experts who, who make sure our wildlife is conserved. At least it's not as bad as Idaho where they just, you know, they, they just passed the bill to allow killing 90% of their wolf population. Ugh. We didn't have that, but you know, we're not far behind them. Um, and so, yeah, and then, and then of course, also 
power grab from the people by election laws that make it harder to vote, and especially students. And one of the bills that passed today actually targeted one particular student organization that registers people to vote by not allowing them to register to vote, people to vote on campus. Yeah. Um, and so voting rights were under attack. Um, Do they explicitly name that group from the floor? No, but they yeah. define it. And it's, it's like if I said, uh, this bill only applies to people with the initials EM who live in Belgrade yeah. And, and wear glasses of a certain yeah. type. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, because there are two notable ones that, that do that all the time. So one is being targeted, one is being, I mean, it's not let off the hook by any means, but it's not as targeted. They'll be in the crosshairs later. So uh, there's, yeah, so this, um, and, and essentially, you know, they know that they've taken over mm -hmm. two branches of government entirely not only taken over, but with a huge advantage. And really it's these other groups that share some of the power according to Montana's constitution, the, the biggest one being the judiciary that stands in their way to being able to just turn this into a, uh, a, a, a dictatorship. Yeah. And so, you know, they would right, you know, the Montana constitution has been interpreted by the court to be very protective of privacy rights that apply to women's health care, mm -hmm. and even more protection than the federal courts have given. They would love to replace those judges and overrule those rulings. You know, the Montana, Const Montana Constitution is unique and it has, it contains the right to a healthful and clean environment. They would love to find a court that says that means nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, but these power grabs are, may, might be called, you know, attempts at centralization of power. So there's nobody to oppose them. Um, and that's, that's a lot of where their efforts went. We could, we could probably talk all night, but we're approaching our half an hour point and I, I just have to ask, what do you think the most important thing for, for people to do before we go and register a whole bunch of voters for next time and fight to get those, get to boost the numbers in the Democratic caucus so that there is some sort of uh, equity and leverage that y'all have to, um, to work with. Um, what can we do in say the next the next 12 months? Well, we're only, what, 16 months, 17 months before an election in November of 2022. And I started my campaign in the summer of the year before the election. In other words, 14 months before the election. So we're three months from campaign starting, if we do it right. And that's the only way we're gonna make a difference. And there's different elements to that. Um, we have to recognize that we lost nine seats this time and all of those were close races. And we, what we don't know is to what extent they, that this was an aberration because of Trump on the ballot and all the craziness that happened. And to what extent Montana has just changed from a purple state to a hard red state. We're going to find that out in 17 months. But the nine seats we lost, by and large, we lost in close races, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in Great Falls and in Billings, but also at least one close race in, uh, in Gallup. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is not really all that complicated. One, we have to find really good candidates. And that doesn't mean candidates who have the right values necessarily, but it means candidates who can win. Uh, yes, we ought to have the right values too, of course. Yeah, but, people but have just to having do the right the values is not enough. And yeah. that means they have to be willing to work hard, and they have to be um, people who can rate who the electorate in their district can relate to. Um, and they need to start 
in a few months in this summer. Uh, last time we had some good candidates, but they, did work, they didn't start until way too late. And that put them at a big disadvantage. So that's the first thing is good candidates. And the second thing is, I hate to say it, but it's true, money. Yeah, I mean, you were the exception and um, we're not <laughs> gonna um, get into that, but would you help those uh, promising candidates who are aspiring um, uh, to get elected in the important districts here in our county? Because we, we sent to the legislature some of the worst. Um, and that's one of the ironies is here's Gallatin County, you know, the progressive beacon of the state but we're five, five Dems and four Republicans, but the four Republicans right. are among the 10 most extreme in the legislature. Yeah. So there, you, there are a lot of Republicans who are fairly moderate, not a lot, but a number. And then there are others who are somewhere in between, but there's, there's only 10 or 20 that I would say are total extremists. And four of them come from Gallatin County. Right. Okay. So, um, and there are, you know, uh, three of them, of those four, were on the Judiciary Committee with me. And I was the only Gallatin County Dem on the Judiciary Committee. And they put what the Judiciary Committee is stacked always with the most extreme people. There's 12 Republicans, seven Democrats. And when they needed the most extreme people, three of the, of the 12 came from Gallatin County. So once more for the record, will you help candidates running for office in Gallatin? Not only will I help, but I am certain that the rest of our caucus will help as they help me. Yeah. You know, yeah. JP, and, and, you know, I talk mostly about the House people because that's who I right. mostly hang around with. But the Senate people are also very talented. JP is a superstar. Um. Chris Pope is new in the Senate, but not new to this thing. And, you know, was a wonderful guy and very, very um, astute. Um, and, uh, and Pat Flowers is, a, is really a talented guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have to see how it's all going to line up. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll see. Pat, I'm sure Pat's up for election. He's going to get a Republican opponent and it's going to be a tough race. So... Maybe our biggest priority in Gallatin County has got to be to defend Pat C. That's number one. But then two, we have to go over, we have to get, we have to win 64. Yeah. Jane Gillette is, is probably, you know, one of the, of the uh, even of the bad Gallatin County reps, she's one of the worst of them, in my opinion. Um, she's run bills that will hurt people. Um, and uh, she needs to, she misrepresents who she is, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, she and came out of the gates just screaming hot with uh, some terrible ideas, like um, a rapist should have full parental rights. Um, and uh, and just... Uh, well, and she's not, in that case, for example, she, oh, oh no, it wasn't that one. There was a, a bill that, uh, an anti-abortion bill that she ran that made no exception for women who are the victims of rape or incest. Right. And when she was asked about why she did that, she said, oh, that's because I just used the bill from two years ago. And so, and it, that one didn't have it. And, and therefore I just was not really paying attention to that issue. So somebody obtained the junk file. That's the file that, yeah. that shows what's yeah. the correspondence when a bill is drafted. Yeah. And it showed that she specifically asked to take that language out. Yeah. So that's an example of some, you know, some really questionable behavior. Um, and, you know, she, she uh, spent a lot of time lobbying for dentists. Um, and I don't know that how many dentists are in her district, but I don't expect people elected her to be the, the spokespeople for spokesperson to dentists. Oh, well, she doesn't. I have nothing dentists. against dentists. Love dentists. Yeah. Uh, when I get back, I'm going to go to first thing I'm going to do is go get my teeth cleaned. But uh, <laughs> now that we're vaccinated, we could do that. It's so much better. I'm going to do that. You know, I have an appointment next week. I actually 
thank a lot of the dentists in, in our state and their lobby, but, but she didn't get elected to be the lobbyist for the dentists. And that was a lot of the work mm -hmm. she did, not the only work she did. Yeah. She also came hard after a bat abortion rights, trans rights, workers' rights. Um, so getting back to the point, remember, it's, this is going to be a very, very different election than two years than last one. Right. Last time it was hard for a, a House or Senate candidate, a local candidate to really get much attention when you have a President Trump on the ballot, a United States senator, a governor, all the cabinet. We could really, be on the doors. And that we could was... be on the doors. But even if you could be on the doors, it, there's so much going on and so many um and so a, many super a, important races. A ballot went to every individual. Some of those people that I observed as a poll worker, um, you could tell, you know, they, I'm not sure they had ever voted before in their lives. And yet they were there to vote a straight ticket. And yeah. they were there, they were there and with an agenda. So, and so it's going to be very different this time. Yeah, and, it was. Um, because there's nothing else on the ballot, ballot except for uh, U.S. Congress. And, and, the, out, and, yeah. and the House and Senate, well, although they've managed to put on the ballot an, an anti-abortion bill, right. which they didn't, they, they put it on the ballot just to drive out the anti-abortion right, right. bill. Right, yeah. So we have to just so, get out the vote. So um, run good candidates, uh, be on doors, get out the vote. The money. Money. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're in charge of and, that. I mean, that's, that's what, it, if you want to, you know, if you want to get out information and the the airwaves are going to be a lot cheaper this time because you're not competing That's for right. airtime with yeah. these these million dollar campaigns. Um, and it's there's they passed several bills that um, are going to make it easier for dark out of state money to come into um, into these local races. And we need to pay attention to that and we need to be ready to combat it. It used to be for a state house race, you could raise five or seven or eight thousand dollars, and that was enough. Those we days are said, gone. Yeah, we said fifteen, but um, yeah. well, it used to, so now it, it it was fifteen. Yeah, I mean that was fifteen was doing really was doing well. I yeah. think it's going to be thirty or forty now if you want to be if you want yeah. to be super competitive, and that can be done. It can be done, but you got to work. Well, look at the price of a democracy that would otherwise um, be diminished or depleted or um, taken over. Yeah. And okay. The, so, the party thoughts. We're at, we're at, 40, we're at 40, 40 plus minutes. Okay. So, parting thoughts. So, I guess, uh, you know, I want to thank the, the people of my district. 62 South Central Bozeman for having given me this opportunity to serve um, and to learn this process uh, so that hopefully next time we can have a, a bigger impact. Um, I've, the whole time I was here, I've tried my best to, to think, to always focus on what it is that the people I'm representing care about what's important, what are the values at stake. And I'm honored to have had that opportunity no matter what happens going forth. It was very hard. It's personally, it's, it takes a big toll from all of us um, in, terms of, in terms of our mental health. And I'm gonna take a little time and detoxify as our, I think our entire delegation, but then we'll be back and we'll be ready to go again and um, just appreciate having that opportunity to serve in this way. It's, it's a huge honor. And um, maybe I'll even figure out if it's supposed to be rabbi representative or representative rabbi. Thank you, thank you. And uh, representative rabbi, rabbi, representative um, Staffman, um, I just wanna say on behalf of all of us, we are so proud of our Democratic Caucus, uh, the freshman class this year, of which you're a part, and um, of each of you. So 
thank you for running. Thank you for winning. Thank you for serving. Um, on behalf of all, all, the entire state, those who agree with you and disagree with you. So please have a, a, a restful, however long it is that you need, because you, you probably need more than a couple of weeks, you know, a month or so, maybe a couple of months. I don't know. Yeah. Well, with COVID sort of winding down, I'm, you know, and not having seen my children or my mom yeah. in nearly in, in a couple of years almost, um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to reconnect with them. And, uh, and then, yeah, so I will take a couple of months between different things. And then it's going to be time to climb back in the saddle. And, and get on your bike. Uh, get on my bike. That's a biggie. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And All right. uh, thanks for your service. It's always great talking with you. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the work you do. Uh, we couldn't do it if it wasn't for you and the team of the Gallatin Democrats that worked so hard uh, to elect us. Wow. And, and you're the unsung heroes here. Well, and we're so a team with you. you. So yeah. it takes, it takes, it, it's a full package. It so, is. So thank you. Thanks. All right. All right. We'll see you soon. Rest well. Bye-bye.